uh, for this chapter, we are dealing with uh, user feedback. So it's basically uh, different ways to provide information to the user. And when, when to use some way or another, it will, it will be dependent in this kind of scenarios. For example, in the case of validation, it informs about invalid states of the user interface. Uh, also notifications to send general messages to the user. A uh, progress bar in case that some uh, some code takes too much to run. And we, we need to, to let the user know about uh, what is the current state uh, of this execution if we are halfway done or, or something like that. Uh, We're also dealing with confirmation. Uh, it, uh, it, it's mostly in the case, if, for example, the user is going to perform some potentially dangerous action and we need a, like a double check before performing such action. Uh, and the last one is to undo a user action, but it, it, it isn't really like, completely implemented. It's a, there is like an, an illusion of this undoing, but then it, then it gets explained why. So, okay, so the first scenario that we're going to see is validation. Uh, it's useful when the user input is bad. So for example, if, uh, if there is a different type expected for some variable, uh, and we're going to do this because even if the, if the code to be executed, it doesn't run, uh, usually the R error, could be displayed in the page, but the Shiny app could be uh, shared with people who don't have quite an experience in programming. So it's better to, to provide a clearer error message than the one that R produces. So to do this validation, we're going to be using the Shiny feedback package. For example, we in this case, we're going to validate an input. Um, to, you, to do that first, we start with applying this function, the use shiny feedback function for the shine from the shiny feedback package. Over here in the first section of the content of our user interface. <laughs> then to, to now actually provide the feedback, uh, it will depend uh, which type of feedback do we want, for example, a warning, a danger, or success. But all of these will be used in the server section of the app. And these are, these are some of the parameters of such feedback functions. Uh, here is a, an example of that. For example, let me open this first one. Over here, uh, over here we're going to see, well, we're going to be working with, with an app where the user uh, inputs some number, but at least for this app, we want this number to be given. So we're going to check on that. And if it is even or not, we will, we will provide or not some message. Okay, so I am in the app, so I'm running it now. Okay, so this is how it looks. We provide some number, 10 is even, so there is some display, but if the number is uh, odd, then, well, the number, there was the transformation was performed, but as we can see, there was this message, this feedback given to the user whenever the number is odd. So now to, to check the code for that app, if you see this, as I mentioned, we first, uh, from, we, we first use this function uh, in the, user interface. And then in this case, we are reading the numeric input over here, the its ID is M, and we're checking if it is an even number. Uh, if it is even, then even this even variable would be true. So basically, in this case, we're using a warning as a feedback. We are defining to which input of the page do, do we want that warning to be uh, seen, like as we saw over here, the warning is in this input, this numeric input. Then 
show is a parameter to to check if this warning should it be shown or not. As you can see here, if even is true, then we don't need to show it because we're only accepting even number. So simply negate this uh, logical value. And now the text, we can specify the actual message that we are providing the user. And you can see over here. Uh, and, and then the, the next is simply uh, now compute such value and then simply display it in the page. But even in this case, uh, we we'll, we can see like a sort of error because in these sort of scenarios where we don't want to, to execute code, for example, when the number is odd, it is, it is getting executed. So we wouldn't we would like uh, for this number to wouldn't be to not be displayed because the input is not what we are saying. So in order to stop this execution, uh, we use this shiny function, correct? So now the changes to this app to hide the output when the input isn't valid is basically this one over here. Is this one? So it's mostly the same. Really, the, the only change is this, this line. For example, what this break uh, function is doing is, is checking if, if this value is true. In this case, even it's a logical variable. If it is true, then simply the execution of this, this code in this reactive environment, this reactive context, uh, it keeps going. So it, it would also and perform this next line of code. However, if this uh, parameter of the ref function is, is false, then the, the code execution stops over there. So these next lines, this reactive expression, they wouldn't be executed. So in, in this case, if I were to run this app and now provide it with an invalid uh, numeric values and inputs, for example, 11, due to this line, it shouldn't be executed because even would be false. So 11, it worked. Uh, so yeah, that's basically about what we were doing. We are canceling execution with red. Uh, as I mentioned, this function checks for required values uh, before allowing Really, not only the code in this reactive expression, uh, but the code in the reactive expressions or output expressions uh, that depend in this parameter. So a couple of examples. Uh, we saw, for example, that even, for, sorry, this parameter for the red function was a logical variable, but it, it really doesn't need to be only that. For example, you could set red, red for multiple arguments and they can be uh, the value of the input. So in this case, what this code is doing is, is continue the execution of the of the code in of the of the code uh, only if inputs A and B have already some established value. Also we can do <coughs> like we perform uh, we 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 provide red with a logical variable. Uh, and it's the same, right? Uh, in this case, this code makes that the execution of the code continues. If this condition that we are giving some parameter, if that condition is true. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, the next example, it's really a, an improvement on, on one of one of the apps that we saw in the beginning, I think in the first chapter. And it was basically like a way to retrieve data from the default data sets that are provided us with. Uh, for example, how can we take a look at such data sets? Okay. We can do the following simply in your R terminal, your R console, type in data, sorry, execute the data function. And these are the data sets. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there is one data set called um, Swiss. 
over here. And basically what the code in the app that I am going to show in a couple of minutes is going to do, uh, it's, it's going to check, for example, we provide uh, a string and we're going to check in, in this list of data sets that I have over here, is there one of them whose name is this one? So if I, over here is exists, there is a table. If I were to run exists, then a name of a data set, and, and then simply check the data sets in the previous table that I showed, then it's true. There is a data set over here, a name twist. And now to retrieve the information from that data set, now that we know that it exists, <laughs> we simply use that. We change this exists um, word to get, uh, this is a Swiss data set. So in this next application, uh, let's see. Yes, in this next application, the author uh, uses the same uh, way that we have already seen for rec, but he also mentions this, this parameter cancel output true. I'm going to show, to show what it does in a moment. So I open this up. Um, it's over here. Okay, so this is the app. We are going to, it's going to give us a, a text area. So we simply can write over here. But it's going to check if the, if the text is, uh, is it the name of an actual data set from the table that we saw, or if it isn't? In the case that it is, then it will display the data from such a data set. We saw that the Swiss data set, uh, it is in there, so that is a table, uh, at least of the first six rows. But now if I were to change the, the name of the data set to one that isn't contained in that table, then it won't show what? It, sorry, it won't show uh, such data set, it can retrieve it. However, due to us using this parameter, cancel output equal to true for the rec function. Uh, it means that despite this uh, failure of the, of the input, because it's an invalid input, uh, it will still show us in the output, uh, the last successful output that we had. In this case, the last successful output was simply stable. So if I if I were to change this cancel output to false, which is the default for red, then it, it will it wouldn't show me anything. If I do this, it would be empty then. And, and lastly, for this uh, for the second section, uh, now it's a way to <coughs> just simply this a little bit simplify the code, but also it happens that. So far, we've been dealing with uh, okay. So far, we've been dealing with doing uh, some feedback in a specific input. However, sometimes the result uh, of our output can be uh, produced due, due to a combination of inputs. In that case, it really wouldn't be uh, like the best idea. <laughs> the, the best idea to to provide the feedback to every input in the app. So instead of doing the input, put it in the, in, sorry, the, the feedback message, put it in, in some input. Now we put the feedback me the message in some output. In the, in the one that uh, the code didn't, ex didn't ex get executed properly. So, uh, and it also happened this, so, uh, when you use validate inside some reactive or output expression, then the, the execution stops, and then the, the message is going to be shown. Not only in the in the output where you are using validate, but in any output that it is dealing with the inputs that somehow some some of those inputs uh, was invalid. So for this example, the author shows us this application. Let's see. Now I'm going to run it first. So remember uh, which example it was. 
see. Ah, yes, so we're going to provide a number. Um, to such number, we can perform two transformations. That is taking the square of such number, the logarithm, the logarithm or the square root. And now the author is checking, for example, over here. It's checking, given this number, uh, input x, if such number is negative and that the information that we are performing is a logarithm or, or a square root, then of course you can't you can't really perform that operation. The functions aren't defined for negative numbers. So because that is the, the error case, then in that case we use the validate. So if this validate code gets executed, that is if this is a condition for the input, then this following code, uh, it doesn't get executed anymore. This code in the render text expression. So I am going to perform that. I will take a negative number and choose, for example, log. And when one, a square works fine, it's well defined. But now as I uh, place in log, then the message that we use for validate is shown. And the same for a square root. Before moving to the next section of identifications, is there some comment or questions? Not for me, thank you. Uh, okay, so then let's continue. Yeah, for is me, you can go on. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the notifications. Uh, in this case, uh, we are not we are not going to display a message in case that there is some problem with the inputs. But now it's simply to inform the user uh, of what is happening. What is happening? Uh, we're going to consider to consider three types of notifications. First will be the transient notification. This will simply be a message that it, it will it will appear in the right the bottom corner of the screen and it will basically disappear after some amount of time that, that we can control as well so let's take a look at the example related to that uh, transient notification and i'll take a look in the code first we're simply defining the button so as we can see when we click that button uh, this code will get executed. And what it's doing is showing the notification via this function. And this is the content of that notification. Then we're going to wait one second and show another notification. But now we can give it also a couple more parameters. So uh, type error parameter will change a little bit the styling of the notification. And uh, similarly, there are other parameters. For example, after waiting another second, this other notification will be displayed and we can change uh, how many seconds do we want to wait uh, for this not notification to disappear. By default it's five seconds, but we can change this to five. Uh, so I'll simply run the app now. I need to look this. Let's see. So I click on the button um, over here in this uh, bottom right corner, the message will be displayed. This one, Johnny or Red, is uh, the one that I labeled as error. Now, the other case for notifications was removing on completion. Uh, those were used to display a message uh, while some long running, long running task is being executed. Uh, well, it, it could be useful, for example, uh, if the running, if such a long running task is being executed, maybe if there is no message, the user doesn't know if the, if the site has crashed or if the code simply uh, like too, too hard for the machine to perform quite quickly. Now, uh, first I'll, uh, run the app. 
Nên ngay được về mấy phần Okay, so I click on this button. We're well in the in the bottom right corner. We have the message. I run it again. It says reading data, and as soon as it disappears, uh, that notification, then this message appears. Uh, such behavior was controlled. Well, very first via the button, so the action, so the, the notification appears once we click on it. Uh, for example. Over here, in this area for this text output for where, where the, message would, the message will be displayed, we have the following code. And we require the input good night, so the user must have clicked the button at least once. Um, now this is the, um, the notification that we are going to define, and it's similar to the previous case. But we now want to remove remove it uh, after some completion, and we do that via uh, assigning such notification to some variable, and then using such variable and the remove notification function to to remove such notification. We remove such notification precisely when the code inside this. A context when the code has already finished finished ex getting executed via this on exit function. Uh, I wasn't sure why this parameter at equal to was added. I mean, we can see the documentation, but still, uh, I, it wasn't quite clear to me. Uh, but then it's simply doing the the user clicks on the button when. So notification shown, a uh, such notification will be uh, hidden once the code of this expression gets executed. And then we'll simply we wait one second and we display the message in such text output. That is simply what it is a notification or message. Ah, and these parameters that we're using now to duration equals nulls, null, is so that uh, the notification really it will it will last forever, uh, except if you uh, remove it with this line of code. And the close button is because well, it had a button in the previous app. I think over here in its upper right corner where you could you can close it before the specify time, but we simply remove it. Uh, and the last case for notification uh, is the progressive update. Uh, as we saw in the first case over here about transient notifications, sometimes when we want to give the user many of these notifications, like they, they get stacked uh, one, of, one on top of the other, so it can be a little bit Spanish, at least from a user interface kind of perspective. So the idea is that you first show a notification and then as some event happen, as some code is getting executed, you can change that the message in that notification. So you can update such a notification and display. So this is the example, let's say, example is there. Uh, maybe let's, um, yeah, let's take a look first at the code. We're going to show a table and now we define a function. So basically to not repeat uh, too many times this structure of a notification that uh, it possibly lasts forever, that is this argument. Uh, it can be closed, it cannot be closed by the user with this argument. But now we're going to use the ID of the of this notification so that then via such ID, we can update a message in the notification show. So for this uh, output, for the table, uh, first we're going to define a reactive expression that, that would be the actual uh, 
data frame provided to to the to the table output so that it then gets um, shown in a table form. So with this data with reactive expression, we <coughs> we use a notify function to simply create our first instance of this notification message. It's simply it's self reading data. It doesn't have an ID. Uh, and now we have to close it instead of the user. So now we say, uh, wait. Um, no. So now we are telling the app so that when the code in this reactive expression uh, finishes, then simply remove this initial notification that we are defining. Then we are we right here. We show the first notification. Then we wait one second. Now, now that we are using the notify function that we defined over here, but now providing an ID uh, and a message, we're making sure that it is actually not a new notification shown, but this first one that was displayed, that now this first notification gets updated. Uh, we do that via passing the same parameters but now passing the ID that we got over here and the new message that we want our notification to display. This is a message. And, and then it's simply repeating it, right? Uh, wait some set, one second, update set notification with another second, update it, and then wait. And then the value of this reactive expression is this empty car data set. So now simply in the table, we are going to show uh, it's the first six rows of such deficits. So now I'm going to run the app now. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to run it again because we, we have to take a look at the bottom right, not yeah, bottom right corner of the of the page. So over here, I run it. And over here it says reading data, reticulating, sharding lama, orthogonal analyzing, and then it displays. Mm -hmm. So it's really the same notification getting updated with message. Uh, by the way, the, does one know why do we have to use this parameter at equal to with on exit? Does anybody know? Well, I mean, it's a this, but I didn't really understand. And if I remove this, so that's basically at equal false, it is still worked. So I, I don't know why the other is. <coughs> uh, now for this, uh, let's, no, no, let's, a uh, new section, progress bars. Uh, similarly to the long running task that we, we saw a, a little bit there earlier, these are going to be great to, <coughs> sorry, this, message, this progress bar is going to be great for long running tasks, but they have to be able to be decomposed into multiple smaller steps. And uh, these steps, they basically have to, to have, sorry, to, to take equal time to be performed. Uh, we're going to see three ways at least to create this, pro, this progress bars. bars. And the first will be uh, simply via the default uh, tools from the Shiny package. Uh, we, would, we would do that with this function with progress. That will be the wrapper for the call code that we are going to be using the whole task. Then this ink progress function, uh, it will be called after each task test step. Uh, basically the argument that you're going to give it is uh, by how much you, do you want to increment the level of completion of the task? Um, that level of completion is measured from zero to one, where one stands for the task uh, has been completely finished. So as an example, 
let's see this one. Uh, we're going to define the number of steps, that is the, the number of, of divisions that we're going to perform to some uh, overall task. Uh, and then we're going to start running the task after we click on this button. And then we're going to simply show uh, some text output where we are going to display what is the actual uh, result of the task that we have performed. So the task will, will be to get some random number. So we're going to define some reactive expression that simply depends on this button that we're going to click. And now we're going to simulate that there are many steps to this task. And each of these steps would be uh, one I mean, what is contained over here in, in the for loop? So this is the, what, what I have highlighted over here is one of the steps. This would be the whole task. Uh, and so due to that, we have to wrap it uh, on the end result with the uh, with progress function. So all over here. Now we have an optional message that we can provide uh, with progress function. Uh, it's basically what we when we show uh, as the task are as, sorry, as the steps of the task are getting performed executed. And now for the individual steps, it will be simply to wait uh, one half of a second and then to update the progress of the that is to update the height or weight of the progress bar. We call this function and we provide it by how much has the progress increased. In this case. There are only these number of steps. So to get to one, we need to increase by its inverse, one over inputs of the steps. And this will be the end result, the, the random number that we want to generate. Uh, now such number will be displayed in this text, text output. So that being the, the whole app, I'm going to, to execute it now. So we say 10 steps, as I click go. And over here in the bottom right corner, the progress bar is getting updated. And now that it has finished, we can see the actual result. And so as we saw, like, I mean, the progress bar is quite uh, like default-ish looking. Ah, sorry, there is a comment. Uh, yes. Yeah, I have something that is critical, but uh, as well, as I was mentioning, is a uh, Dutch progress bar is a little bit default ish. So, and uh, the other also mentions the use of this waiter package. Um, it will provide us with more tools to actually uh, stylize uh, such progress bar. We're, we're going to see, I think, three examples of such stylization. So first, let's take a look at this one. It's, I think it's a most basic one. Zero nine. Uh, and also the, the, <clears throat> the, the actual code for the app, it also changes a little bit. Before we had to, as I mentioned, we had to grab the whole task with this one function and then grab each step. Sorry, after each step gets executed, calling the increase of the progress. But, but now that we're going to be using the waiter package, it's going to be quite different. So first, similarly, uh, as it happened with the shiny feedback package, you call in this, in this line in the beginning of the user interface. We're going to be using the use waiters function. Uh, and really the next will be similar. Uh, how many steps? Press a button and then show the result. So it's basically the same. Over here it changes. We are defining waitress as a, a new instance of waitress. A waitress will be this one over here. It, it, it is a, a kind of progress bar. So what we're going to give it this type of progress bar, it's a, the maximum number of steps. 
So then when the whole, when all of the steps have been executed, so when the whole task has finished, close this progress bar. And now for the actual steps, one by one, it's similar, it's a little bit, a little bit more similar to the other one. When you perform some operation, we'll simply wait, and then you, uh, you add the increment for your progress bar. Now the, the, the increment uh, is one by one, where we set the maximum to be the number of steps. So now the actual result of this whole task would be to get this random number, and then we simply display it in the page. So let's see. I'm going to run it. No. Okay, so if we go, and I think that the bar will be shown a little bit over here above. Yes, can you see? Uh, maybe one second. Yeah, we saw it. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the advantages of this package is that it provides us with more customizability for the actual progress bar. Um, a couple of examples are that for this type of progress bar, setting a scene. So I'm going to run, run the app again now that I have set the overlay scene. So let's take a look. That's how it changes. Let's see now. Ah, oh, wait, I have to reload it. Okay. Now we can actually see the content, so it become it became uh, some transparent. And now that I run it again, it shows also the numbers to represent the progress. Now, wait. Um, and it's okay. I got a, a little confused. So well, those those were some of the examples for this progress bar. But really, there is a ton of customization. Um, this, basically, this is basically the page for how to do it. So now let's see at the spinners. It's a display an animated spinner when you don't know how long an operation will exactly take. In some sense, this is probably a better idea instead of doing this progress bar, uh, because it's really quite difficult to, 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 to satisfy this requirement for the progress bar, that each of the steps, each of the steps, the whole task, uh, require the same, the same amount of time. So in this case, we now uh, take a look at two examples. One, how to create an spinner with the waiter package. And then we're going to be looking at another spinner but now the way to, to create it, it's really, really much more simple than uh, all of the other ways that we have been looking at right now in, in this chapter. So to finish with the waiter package, we now take a look at its spinner. Uh, wait, okay, it says a simple thing. Uh, okay. So let's see. Ah, uh, no. Let me open the other one. We used this use waitress. This was uh, this. No, no, no. Wait, wait. No, yes, it's okay. This was this type of progress bar that we were using in the previous app. But now in this new app, we are going to be using another type of uh, of progress bar. Wait, actually, see. Uh, wait, let me run this. I'm not sure if this is also a progress bar or if we are looking at uh, oh, and, at the actual spinner. So I think I had added one more example from the waiter package. I don't know, it's a spinner, it's okay. So yeah, waitress we use for the progress bar with waitress, but now for the spinner is use waiter. Uh, it's really the same app, uh, some buttons, some text. So now over here, it also changes. We are no longer using waitress new, but now waiter new. 
Um, the parameters are a little, a little bit different. For example, in this case, I wanted to emphasize so something that we could also do with the previous progress bar, but it's the fact that you can make this progress bar or a spinner be uh, inserted, not necessarily over here in the top of the page, but it, it, uh, it isn't really quite visible, but you can insert it in some specific output. In this case, we're inserting such a spinner or progress bar in this text output. Now, for the actual spinner, there is this animation that is going to be shown. We have a couple of ways to do it. Uh, we simply, I simply chose that one. And uh, you can also change the color of the spinner. Uh, and also over here, I forgot to mention, for the outputs where you're going to show that spinner, it, it really doesn't have to be only one. You can set it to many of them. Um, over here, it changes a little bit the notation, but I mean, it doesn't matter. Now, we wait some time and run the application. Ah, the important part is that we are no longer increasing the progress bar. We simply show it. The, we show the spinner. We hide it when the whole code uh, has finished getting executed. And now what it is getting executed is simply this it waits some random amount of time between one and five seconds, I think. And then simply the value that we want is this random number. So we're going to display that number. So, okay, so I run the other. I basically have the spinner. I think if I were to not use this, it will show the spinner, let's say, in, a, in the page. And uh, yes. Uh, now with the color that I specify. So, uh, and because this is quite a little bit cumbersome, at least if you want your, like, to create your app really, really fast, because we're, we're having to create a spinner or the press bar showing uh, and then hiding it. The faster way to do that is via this package, Chinese, Chinese CSS loaders. And it's a simple way to create spinners. For example, let's take a look at, take a look at this one over here. It's really like the same map, but if it didn't have a progress bar, no spinner, no anything. And the only thing that is changing you know, from, from the app without any feedback to the user, is this over here that to the output we're wrapping it with this with the spinner function from the shiny CSS loaded package? Um, well, it's a little bit different in the sense of what are we doing? We simply wait some seconds and get some random data frame and then uh, plot it. So let's see, I'm going to run this up. Uh, how, how has the spinner changed? Let's see. Okay. Well, that was too fast, but it was that, that, that single. Then for this later, well, this last part about confirming and, and doing actions, and we basically require this in the case when some action by the user can have pretty dangerous consequences. It could be something like uh, removing files or something like that. Um, we're going to be taking a look at three techniques. But really, the third one we really didn't we didn't even get an example. The, the author doesn't provide it, so it's almost like only two two ways. So the first one is explicit confirmation. Let's see, we use a dialog box for the user to confirm some possibly destructive destructive action. So it's basically a double check. Uh, let's see, it's an example as well. So this is the app. Now, we're, go we're going to be using a dialog box. And we define that via this function, the model dialog. Or here is a message for that box. It's the title of that box. And then in the later part of the, well, in the footer of that box, 
we can define buttons and assign actions to them. Uh, one will we'll call cancel and another okay to represent the deletion of files. And then, of course, you can use bootstrap uh, CSS classes to change also the appearance of such button. In this case, we are deleting files and it's quite dangerous, so let's make it look dangerous ish. Okay, so this is a way to create such dialogue books. Okay, so our app is if this button to perform the deletion of files. And then in the server, let's see, we observe the event button delete. So it basically, when we click in that initial button, then show model that is display the dialog box that we have defined in the beginning. Then it says, if you click OK, and that is the OK button in this dialog box, that is, if you want to delete the files, what we would do is show a notification. We already saw what that was, that the files have been deleted, and now remove or, well, or hide the dialog box. However, if after showing the dialog box, the user clicks on the button to cancel the operation, then simply well, hide the, the dialog box. So let me run the app. Uh, well, of course, over here, you, you will actually do the, the code for deleting the file. But it, it has some examples, so th there is no code for that. So I will simply run the app. Okay, let's see. I click on it. It opens up this dialog box, and I have to click on these buttons to double confirm the action that I want. I click cancel, so there is no dialog box. But now that I click again, but I click on delete, and the dialog box appears. And supposedly that the files would have been deleted. So delete, this is really a, a double check. Then I'm doing an action. Uh, it's it's actually quite similar to a double check, but the, the second check, uh, like it invalid, in a way it invalidates the first one that you did. It's like over here that we click delete the files, well, but we actually click cancel. So it, it, it's very similar, but now, and there will be a time restriction. So let me uh, provide us with example that the author uh, show us. He says, we will not really undo an action, but provide a couple of extra seconds before the action is performed so that the user can check for possible errors uh, and provide and prevent them uh, from, sorry, and prevent the action from occurring. Uh, and well, and then he mentions about the, this application on Twitter. Um, that is in the case of if you have tweeted, sorry, if you have defined the content of your tweet, but maybe you want to, uh, sorry, and you press tweet, but you wanted to to change it because maybe too late you 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 realize that there was a typo or something, and uh, well, he decided for the the action to be undone, and he basically simulates sim simulates simulates it in this application. So we provide the user to some area where he can, where he or she can write, uh, and then a button that will represent that such text is a, the content of your tweet. So tweet it. Then uh, I didn't really understand completely this application, but let's see. Uh, he defined this function. Uh, it basically about this about this one. Invalidate later. Uh, basically, this will be what will stop uh, the action from taking place. That is the action that well, this action button will do. That, that will be to actually tweet uh, the message. But then for the server, uh, let's see, we have some variables. And then this is that when the user presses this button, this tweet button, uh, we define the, a notification that is going to be shown for the dialog box, and um, it will simply be tweeted and the message and that the user has written. Then last message would be 
to retrieve the message that the user had uh, written before the, the before the leading because he, he can undo the, the the action. And now uh, this is this is actually the first time I think that we are seeing uh, at least uh, up to this chapter in the book the the use of the session parameter and that is to update the content of some previously previously defined uh, input element in this case we have this text area input so to change its its value and we would do over here wait yes over here we would do update text area input we use session uh, i think because when you run an app, uh, every user has to have a different instance of the app. So like if you click on some button in your application, it shouldn't affect this same application but running for a different person in another part of the world. So the session provides us with an identifier per user. So that's why we have to use it in this case. And then to, to this input, to this area input, now its value, we're changing it to null. So we retrieve the message, then we clear the, the text area, and then we are simply going to join the, the notification. This is what we have already been working on. The notification was the what the person actually tweeted. Then the action button to undo the, the, the action, that is to undo the tweet. And again, uh, we have to manually close it. Then to manually close this notification. Uh, let's see, he defines an ID for this notification so that he can then remove it over here via this ID. Um, because, I mean, it's kind of a dangerous, dangerous activity. We simply specify type one. It isn't necessary. Really. So now over here, this is the part that I, I, I didn't have quite clear. Perhaps, perhaps if some of you I understood it better. Can explain me? Can explain us later, later on? So he defines. Uh, no, sorry. He uses the, the run later function. This thing over here. Uh, he provides it. Let's see. This text, and then this action to to remove the, the notification that we have. But I'm not sure uh, how does it play into it, the symbol is later. Uh, well, and then simply uh, next to that, let's see, input and do. So in, in, the, in, the, in the notification that we showed over here, we had, to, we had one button to undo the tweet. So it says that if such button to undo the tweet was uh, clicked on, then to destroy this I uh, still am not sure what it does and then simply show a new notification that that, that we was attracted and we provide the initial text area that we had cleared and the message that that we saved just in case if the if the person attracted his in his his speed. So it's really, I you know, it's very complicated to explain. So let's, let's just take a look at it. Let's see. Uh, so this is my tweet. I click tweet. Now this dialog uh, pops up, but only for a couple of seconds. Because I didn't click on undo, my message was uh, deleted. So let's see, I try it again. But now I, I will click and do. So now this shouldn't be clear. Uh, of course, the actual action of tweeting shouldn't happen, but such action is not defined in, in the code. So I click and do. This dialog box is shown. Sorry, the notification is shown. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> From what I, I understood, uh, this should have not been cleared because we are updating its value. Ah, uh, maybe it's because of this. Uh, let's see, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. 
Okay, so does anyone, did anyone understand this? Who can explain it better to us? Um, Matthew, if you were talking, uh, we couldn't hear you. Um, but I didn't get this far in in the chapter, um, so I I'm not sure. Mm, yeah, I mean, at most, for example, a couple of details maybe that we could like. Uh, take note of uh, the use of these thing. And this thing, this assignation, I think it's called a global assignment. But I know, I mean, every time that I have worked with Shiny, I have read that we shouldn't use this. So I don't know why it's okay to use it now and why now it works. So, well, I, I have to look up, look up uh, what's happening. But then just to finish uh, this chapter, he then mentions this last method for confirming, well, for undoing really. And there is one, well, what we have in our PC, right? A, a crash folder or after deleting some files, it, it isn't really like deleted. So it, it's like it is moved to some other directory where then you can retrieve it. And, and perhaps uh, an implementation of this with Shiny, um, it could be something via using the cookies package well, I don't you know. I, that's just a hopeful hypothesis. I haven't really done it. And the author says that such an implementation needs outside of the scope of the book. So I don't know. So that's really it. Uh, well, thank you for, for watching.